Okay, good morning to all. I have the uh, privilege of moderating a panel on inclusive growth strategies in emerging markets. And we have two very distinguished executives who have a unique window into emerging markets, into inclusive growth, uh, into really what's happening. Uh, with us this morning is uh, Carol Tomei, CEO of UPS. Pleasure to have you, Carol. Nice to see you again. Good to see and you. And Blanca Trevino, CEO of SoftTech, who joins us from Mexico, Coahuila. Yes. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> UPS, and I, when I saw these numbers, I was just, uh, I was marveled. 2% of global GDP. You actually move around the world. 2% of global GDP, 6% of US GDP moves through your global network. That is uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, and then on Softec, uh, Blanca, not only uh, are you a global company, you're founded in 1982, but the largest provider of IT services from Latin America. So you also have this unique view of what's happening in these important uh, emerging markets. I can't think of two better guests to discuss inclusive growth, uh, the focus on emerging markets, uh, than, than Carol and Blanca. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I'm going to kick it off, Carol, if I may, I'll go to you. And um, the pandemic impact on, on global trade, it seems like uh, trade is bouncing back uh, there's a sense of optimism, a sense that things are returning somewhat to some normality. Uh, what are you seeing? Are global supply chains responding? Is there still a void? Uh, what's out there? Well, I'm delighted to be here today. And thank you so much, Carlos, for your question. And hello, everyone. Um, we are at UPS are at the intersection of global trade and the digital economy. And to your point, business has bounced back and bounced back in a big way, in large part driven by the pandemic, because there's been a step change in e-commerce sales around the globe. As people were sheltering in place, they were buying things online, and we certainly saw that come into our network. That trend continues into 2021, and I can make that real for you by just looking at our performance in the first quarter. If I, I look at our business outside the United States, it was very growthy. In fact, all of our export lanes reported double digit positive growth. Our commercial business outside of the United States grew by 10% in the first quarter. And our small and medium sized businesses also grew about 23% outside of the United States. There, there is a demand supply imbalance, which is causing opportunities for pricing to be firm um, and for businesses like UPS to really uh, perform. Now, there are some supply chain challenges as we are well aware of. These would be raw material challenges. These would be parts of the worldwide supply chain that's gotten gummed up, be it the Suez Canal or here in the United States on the West Coast. But other than those challenges, the business climate is very robust. Hmm. Supply demand imbalance, that really sums it up. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, Blanca, services trade up 60% faster than goods um, and obviously driven a lot by uh, digital tech. So you're in the right place at the right time. Um, how is that translating to growth in emerging markets? And do you see any patterns there? Yeah, let me start by thanking you again for inviting me to this and sharing the panel with both of you. And uh, Yes, when you think about it, we are in the right time and the right place. That's what you said, and I completely agree with you. And uh, yes, despite the fact that uh, some emerging markets, particularly Latin America, may lag in terms of digitization of services compared to advanced economies, it is irrefutable that more and more services are being delivered in a digital fashion and are becoming borderless. And as you rightly point out, our industries perhaps at the forefront of this digitization and elimination of borders. And we have been delivering services to the US and Europe from Mexico from over two decades now. So using digital technologies and the legal framework provided by international treaties like 
NAFTA or USMCA like, like today, right? But now we're seeing this evolving into a more more services. Financial services industry has been digitized rapidly. The fastest growing financial services firm in Latin America is Nubank, which was recently valued at $25 billion and it is the latest round. So a bank in Latin America that has no branches and is growing despite the regulation that exists in Brazil, and no one can argue that they are growing because of the heavy regulatory environment. But they have focused on designing banking experiences that isolate their customer from those regulatory burdens and uh, provide a refreshing approach focus on the client. The pandemic just, be, just came to reinforce, and Carol mentioned this, how relevant a digital pure player, pure play can be in customer financials. So you can see this trend also in many spaces from entertainment like with Netflix, Disney Plus, HBO Max, or music streaming like Spotify or Apple Music. These are services that kept growing despite the pandemic. And we can argue that they grew even fat further because of the pandemic. But as vaccines roll out, we will see more of the services sector growing. But a big engine for growth of the segment has been the rise of digital. Perhaps the most representative sector for this is the restaurant industry. Services mm -hmm. like Group Hub, Uber Eats, as our Latin American Rappi, played an enormous, enormous role in, in keeping the restaurant industry afloat. It try to imagine what would have happened without Uber Eats to all those restaurants that kept running because of that. Uh, one of our customers, a big fast food restaurant chain, saw themselves through digital aggregation like Uber Eats, like I just mentioned, or Postmates, grow from less than 10% to over 60. And, and I think you mentioned some of this. So this changes in how consumers interact and consume services using digital tools will never go back to pre-pandemic levels. We, we truly believe that. So the change is permanent. Uh, perhaps it will subsidize a little, but it will never go back as it was in 2019. So it is changing. It is changing even in emerging markets, like, like you mentioned. That's great. We will never go back. And if you're doing well now, I can just imagine uh, once the vaccine has been uh, rolled out. Um, uh, Kara, I failed to congratulate you on your incredible results. Um, you know, we talk about in inclusive growth. Uh, there are customers of all sizes. And in order for it to be truly inclusive, we have to think about medium, small, and even micro firms. Uh, <clears throat> what are you seeing there? And, and uh, what can be done uh, to include them in this return to prosperity? Well, we have a laser focus on growing small and medium-sized businesses around the globe. Um, and I couldn't agree more with what Blanca just said. It's all about a digital experience. It's what they need to have digital fluency and digital capabilities to conduct commerce wherever they are in whatever geographies they want to play. And we're leaning into that in a big way. Uh, we have 16 customer journeys that we've identified to simplify the experience for this customer, making it easier for them to can, can, uh, have commerce with UPS and ship their packages through us. We were built for that, but we're simplifying it and really thinking about the experience from end to end from the shipper to the recipient. And we're seeing that focus on the experience really starting to take hold. We grew our small and medium-sized businesses globally faster than any other customer segment mm. in the first quarter alone. And one thing we've invested in is uh, a platform we call our digital access platform. And this is where we are partnering with companies like Shopify and Stops.com and e uh, eBay and Facebook and many, many others who have stood up platforms for these small and medium-sized businesses, including micro businesses, to sell through their platform to their end customer. And we're delivering the packages on the other side of that, of that tr transaction. This was a, a concept a, a thought back in the second quarter of 2019. Our DAP business or our digital access program will be a $1 billion business this year, and we're taking it globally. And we see demand for this in every market in which we operate. So we're, we're very excited about what it means uh, to support this customer segment because it's an important segment to serve. 
Those are amazing numbers, truly amazing numbers. And the speed with which you've reached those numbers is, is incredible. Uh, Blanca, your thoughts on, on how uh, the digital revolution is helping these uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies throughout the region, throughout the world. Right. Well, Carol already mentioned something that it's impressive and how they have been able to support that 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 growth and how they, they have been able to play in this. I, I cannot imagine how they will be able to do it without without UPS. It, it is it is incredible what they're doing. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. But there has never been a better time for small businesses. I truly believe that. And uh, like we have been saying, it's, it's leveraging that technology and the amount of technology at their disposal will have been unimaginable just 10 or 15 years ago. Try to imagine that. And to achieve what a small business can do today, a company in the 90s, in the 90s, remember that, probably we've been there, uh, we have had to invest millions of dollars. E-commerce capabilities, for instance, you can create a storefront in, in Amazon or, or Mercado Libre, in the case of Latin America, in a matter of minutes. And that can open you up for a market as big as you want. You have access to a global market. It can be regional, national, or global. It's up, it's up to that small business, but they do have mm -hmm. that, that access. And uh, by the way, Mercado Libre, it's the most valuable company in Latin America. And it is for a re reason. It has the highest market cap that uh, that uh, any any other that American Mobile, FEMSA, or Petrobras that are also incredible. But but uh, just look at, at Mercado Libre, and again, it is it is for a reason. Uh, a small business can leverage that platform, and and uh, Carol just gave us some examples of the, those platforms. Um, but again, they can leverage that in a matter of hours. So mm -hmm. let's go back to supply chain, global supply chain. Uh, you can really have UPS and you can source your supplies or distribute your products on the click of a button. Advertising, you can leverage Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, even TikTok, mm -hmm. to promote your products in a highly effective fashion. So again, imagine that 10, 15 years ago, impossible, impossible. impossible. Now it is at a, at a reach of, of every business, regardless of its size. So to better answer the question, what is holding, the, what is holding them back? Uh, maybe it's the better digital awareness. I, I will say that. And, and we have to invest in that. But it, I, I truly believe that there has never been a better time for small businesses. And Blanca, you're seeing not only uh, consumers adapt to the new digital economy, but small businesses as well. Absolutely. Uh, that, yeah. So go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Finish the question. Go ahead. Yeah, no, just uh, wondering if small businesses are keeping up with the digital transformation. We know consumers are. Uh, are small businesses as well uh, keeping up with that? <clears throat> and I think there are, you have both, right? Those that, that understood how important and, and how they, they could be able to do what I just described. Uh, and obviously those that were not able to move towards that or didn't have that kind of awareness of, or understanding, or even a, a small investment that it's needed, because again, I will emphasize that it's a small, it, 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 take a look at what Carol just mentioned or the way that advertising is today. Uh, so it's small businesses have this chance that they didn't have before. Uh, try to imagine if you asked me this 10 years ago, I would say there was no way for them to face what we have. But today with digital technologies, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it is possible. Absolutely much possible than it was 10 years ago. So I, I think, Carlos, that yeah, you see both different kinds of companies, those, those that really understood that, that probably are, are new companies. Uh, I think they were more, de they did have that digital awareness. And you have all, I would say not all, but companies that have been there for some time, still small, and they just couldn't could understand how they could leverage this. So I think we 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 see both, Carlos, from my perspective, some that were able to to take advantage of this, and some others that that probably they they have not been able to really understand the potential, and they are sometimes concerned and they don't understand the implications, but also the opportunities. I'll I'll say that. 
Yeah. All of a sudden, small businesses can access the world. They can become exporters. It's amazing. Right. Um, uh, Carol, UPS deserves a lot of credit for vaccine distribution. And sometimes we don't realize that uh, the vaccines have to get places and, and we don't even uh, stop and think, how is it that they're getting there so quickly and so efficiently? And it, it's thanks to companies like UPS. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the linkage between vaccine distribution and recovery? There, there, there must be a, a, a direct link as we're seeing here in the US in emerging markets. Well, we are so proud and privileged to be part of this moment uh, to be delivering vaccines. Uh, today, we have delivered 250 million vaccines to over 92 countries. And by the end of the year, we estimate we will have delivered 1 billion vaccines. Wow. And it's a complicated supply chain, as you can appreciate. We basically run a network within a network. We have special labeling that goes on the packages that carry the vaccines. We've st stood up control towers to watch those packages as they travel across the network. We manufacture dry ice that accompanies the vaccines for certain of those vaccines that need to be chilled. We have freezer farms in three parts of the world. So it's, it's super complicated, but we're really, really proud to be part of it. And we're delivering at 99.9% .9 delivery efficiency. So we're not missing a deadline, which is important too, because these are time sensitive. Uh, biologics. And you know, we've been in this, this industry for a while. And, and what we believe um, that you can't have sustainable economic recovery until we've got everyone safe. And the only way you get everyone safe is you have to have an equitable distribution of the vaccine. You know, I'm a capitalist, I'm a businesswoman, and I'm making money on these vaccines that we're delivering. But we also know there are parts of the world where we need to get vaccines distributed in a different way. So we are supporting COVAX and NGOs and other organizations to get vaccines into those parts of the world where it's not going to, the commercial relationship isn't going to be the same. And in fact, we're committing some of our humanitarian dollars in this regard. Uh, we all are watching what's happening in India. It's tragic there. Um, last week, we announced a, a, a million dollar uh, contribution to help in that regard. We're real focused on making sure that we can help the parts of the world that need help. Because without it, if we don't have equitable uh, vaccines, we just don't think the recovery is sustainable. So we've got to get it, got it done. One cool story is we are partnering with, we, we were the first company that was authorized by the FAA to have a drone airline. So we do have a drone airline called uh, UPS uh, Flight Forward. We partnered with another drone company to actually deliver vaccines in Rwanda using drones. How cool is that, right? So there's a lot of cool technology that's coming into the vaccine uh, distribution as we go about this journey. That's great. Yeah, that, that's one of the stories that I think needs to be told more and more is the role of the private sector. And uh, UPS is probably the best example I can think of, of the private sector really stepping up and making things happen. So. Thank you and, and congratulations. Uh, Blanca, you have a, a unique view of financial services. We've been talking for quite a while about the unbanked and how we can include more companies, more businesses in the uh, mainstream banking system. Uh, what are you seeing there? Is, is the digital revolution also um, helping small and medium-sized businesses uh, be included and be part of uh, the, the the banking and the financial system. Yeah, let me start by taking the opportunity to to tell Carol how proud they should be of the role they are playing and how we all should be very grateful because you have been key, not just during the pandemic and helping all the things that you described, but being part of this vaccination and, and the numbers are impressive. When you think about, you mentioned that you're going to be able to deliver probably 1 billion vaccines. Mm -hmm. It is incredible. I, I know and I agree it should be very complicated, but I'm I'm, I'm absolutely sure that we are all amazed by the numbers and all grateful to, for the, the, the work that you're doing. So I, I wanted to take that opportunity. Thank, Thank you so you. much. But going to your question, Carlos, I, I think no one can argue that the play, the, the, I mean, the role of digital technologies in this financial inclusion. Without that technology, I truly believe it will be very, very difficult. And, uh, and, and, and let's think about Again, it will be impossible, impossible without digitization or access to mobile devices. 
Well, think about India. It's a very good example in a different perspective or how they have been able to, the, to, to really leverage that technology and giving that access to every small community. But, but mobile devices change completely in the, obviously the financial uh, institutions, no matter what kind of player you are allowed to happen. It, you can be in every community without having any kind of branch. And um, probably the reason for that is that, that you have new and new digital players and different kind of players. You can think of the big techs or the fintechs, absolutely important, the fintechs or neobanks, telcos, even telcos. And, um, and, and probably if we start by, the, by, by those uh, small, small or, or new players, they have focused really on a very specific process or, or whatever issue they might have. And that, that will give them and probably access to credits. Some others are more that for payment methods or even investors. But uh, probably the huge difference that they were, they started a 100% digital, those, those kind of players. And uh, most of them, they don't, they, don't have, they don't have any kind of assets. And, uh, but they focus on those very probably spaces where traditional banks are, they see that it's, that it's difficult. Uh, again, when you think about big techs or, or fintechs, and uh, probably when, when you think about big techs, um, you think, look at Google, Apple, Facebook, even Amazon, they are, they are moving into this, this space. They are offering those kind of services because they have access to a very large customer base. But uh, I mentioned before Nubank, it, for neobanks, if you want to call it that way, it's, um, they, they emerge that way. They emerge as a, as a digital bank. And again, competing, competing with, the, with the huge uh, traditional banks because they are very focused. They leverage technology. They understand that they are not, they don't have those big assets on their back. So, so they are more flexible. They are more, they, they, they can have that access without having that. But something that is important, Car Carlos, it's regulation. I think that if, if one thing, it's probably it's speeding or stopping you, you can see it either way, it's regulation. And um, again, different governments are doing this in a different way. And that will either, again, like I said, speed up or stop this financial institution. It is, it is key. Again, when you look, look at India, it's incredible. When you look at other, probably even Latin American companies, when you don't have access to internet in, in those very far away communities, it will be difficult because even though you might have digital technologies, if you don't have access to internet, it's, it's gonna be difficult. So, so it, it is all dependable on that, uh, and that, that public policies that will allow them to have that, uh, but again, leveraging technology and having all those different players, giving those different alternatives to, to, to every community, to everyone. What you can do with your mobile device is incredible. When, when I started my career and uh, remember those huge computers, huge, they would take a, a, a completely a room, more than a room, but with your mobile device, it's not just that you can buy something from Amazon. It's not that you can order something for or schedule something for UPS. It's everything that you can do related to financial services, no matter where you are, no matter if there is a bank branch there, it is, it is incredible. And again, I think the challenge is for governments to really make sure that, that the, the policies are there, that they do have access to that internet, and from my perspective, that is the chance. You do have the players. You do have the mobile devices. Uh, probably you, you have to, education will be key for them. Those, again, far away communities, you have to probably help them to understand uh, how can they leverage this. Um, but it's incredible. Carlos, from my perspective, the tools are there, the trends are there. So it's up to the governments to, to uh, again, close this gap and give them that access. Uh, Africa, India, it's incredible mm -hmm. people that are doing this. Sometimes much better, much better than countries that you might think that, that they will do it very easily. Yeah. Well, because they yeah. need it. 
probably the, that was the only way. And those players that we mentioned, they, they understood the opportunity and they put everything on the table in order to make this happen. Thank you. You know, one of the things that makes uh, your achievements, uh, UPS, uh, SoftTech, other companies, is that before COVID, uh, trade was undergoing a lot of disruption. So it's, it's not like, uh, you know, you've been able to do this in a very smooth operating trade environment. We, we've had all the, the trade disruptions that, that we all know well. And then on top of that, here comes COVID. So the, the, the Biden administration, I, I don't want to read these, these points here. Uh, they've talked about that they're, they want trade that is worker-centered, uh, focused on the middle class or benefiting the middle class, and benefiting communities uh, and people of color and women. Uh, so th those are the things that, that they would like their policy. Uh, uh, to benefit those people, uh, those communities. Um, I have two questions for each of you. One is, how are you dealing with those disruptions that are probably still out there? Uh, I mean, you mentioned 99.9% um, uh, accuracy in, 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 in delivery. Uh, that's amazing, considering the disruptions that were out there. How are you dealing with that? And do you have one or two recommendations on trade policy that can help inclusive growth in emerging markets. Uh, would you like to start, Carol? Happy to. Um, so we're focusing on the wildly important. You know, there are a lot of things that are happening in the world, but by focusing on the wildly important, we're not letting the distractions get in the way of doing what we must do. Clearly delivering vaccines on time wildly important. So it's about resource allocation, where we put our head content, where we put our dollars on those things that really matter, and taking some things off the table that just don't matter anymore. And we are constantly re revisiting the wildly important list because the world around us is changing so quickly. But that has certainly helped us stay laser focused on what we have to, to do. And as I think about, okay, what's next? When we think about the impact of the pandemic, we know that women were impacted more than any other uh, group. And even before the pandemic, women had barriers for global trade. Some of those were real barriers, regulatory barriers, and some of those were more of biases, like pink tariffs. But we've really got to think about how we can leverage into women and helping them grow global trade. There was great research done by McKenzie that said that if men and women were to trade equally, it would add something like 20, 20 plus trillion dollars to the global economy. So the business case is solid. Now we just got to move. We got to move. We've got to get some changes to regulations. These could be empowered by the G7 and supported by the WTO. We've got to get rid of the biases that are out there. And companies like UPS, well, we can make a difference too. We've just stood up a woman's exporter program, uh, enabling women entrepreneurs to export into four Latin American countries. We're very excited about that. We're supporting 3 million women in she trades. So we're putting our money, our actions behind this because we think that we can help change the narrative when it comes to women and global trade. It's interesting that as, as I, you're talking, it's COVID has been devastating for so many countries, people. Uh, but as you look to the future, there's some good things that are going to happen, such yeah. as the inclusion of women in trade. And, uh, and that's very insightful, very insightful. Blanca, what, what do you think of the trading environment and what are the one or two things that you'd like to see? Well, the first thing that I was, I was really energized to hear was that that, that you that, that the Biden administration understood that something policies were needed. It, when you do understand that and you start making things that that's the best sign that you can have. If you if you don't take a look at that, that, that is a problem, that, that is something that you have to take care, it, it, it will take so much time. So first of all, I have to say that that I really I, I really look at this as, as something that it's very, very important when you when you see a, a, an administration understanding that it is needed. Carol shares some examples that are that that it that are absolutely true. And and again, when you see 
a government or administration that understand this and will put in place policies is very encouraging from my perspective. But also when you think about, and, and, and it is true, uh, uh, COVID was devastating and uh, probably it, it, it gave it so, it was very clear and very transparent or some inequalities, if you want to call it that way. They put it in the, in the clear. It was it was very obvious. But but I believe that disruptions also and, and situations like COVID, as devastating as they were, it also again make us to think what what is the best way to contribute into this? And uh, women, and, and women absolutely is one of the things that we need, how we support them, how we support them. But also, and, and you made this question about small businesses, disruption, again, when you think about all of this, disruption give you also opportunities. And it's up to you, either if you're a woman, if you're a company, if you're a small business, to really understand this. We have to say that at least the U.S. government really understand this, and they are putting their eyes there and everything that it's needed. The policies. It was. I'm sure you're familiar with the USMCA. That's this treaty between this the, our Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And uh, it's interesting the way that that probably the the first thing that will not agree or that we will question each other. And there was the first meeting yesterday between the the Minister of Economy. And uh, it is related to those kind of things, how the three countries are aligned in giving this kind of things. I mean, allowing them to, to, to making this happen, which is also encouraging. It, but we have to look at disruption as an opportunity and uh, as an opportunity when, when you understand all the different things that are needed. And I completely agree with, with Carl and the, the role that we have to play in order to support the different things that we're seeing, Carlos. Thank you, thank you. We've had the privilege of listening to two of the great business leaders who are making things happen, uh, who are solving problems. As we think about the world is getting better, we often forget about who's making it happen. Um, and business leaders such as Carol Tomei, CEO of UPS, Blanca Trevino, CEO of SoftTech, congratulations. And on behalf of so many people, around the world. Thank you for everything you're doing. And thank you for being here. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you. Our pleasure.